Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. I have another Air Force veteran uh, with me today. I've got Douglas Berry, who is a, a children's author. Got a couple of books out about a little rabbit named Jasper. And uh, so this is not your typical episode of us. Uh, but don't worry, it's not all about children's books. Uh, but uh, Doug, welcome welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, before we get started, I want you to share a little bit about your story. What did you do in the Air Force? You know, what uh, what was the, the magic thing that uh, made you jump into the Air Force and all that stuff? Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't make a lot of good decisions when I was 20 years old, but that was the best one I could have made. Um, didn't really see, uh, I knew I wanted to get a pension when I was uh, older. I uh, didn't see a lot of factories at that point in time. Uh, they were getting away from pensions, that sort of thing. So I'm like, well, let me get in the Air Force. Uh, noble career. Uh, went in as a uh, armament system specialist, loaded A-10s and F-16s. Uh, didn't move around as much as most. Uh, was stationed at Davis Mothin, was my first duty station. Down in tech, uh, Tucson, Arizona. Loved it down there. Then off to... Uh, Kunsan, South Korea for our, a year there. Uh, didn't really care for that too much, but, you know, some things you like, some things you don't. It's just, hey, it's it doesn't matter how long you spend in. You're going to have some places you like, some places you don't. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then uh, from there, I went to uh, Shaw Air Force Base, and I stayed there for 15 years. Uh, one of the many acronyms for Shaw is stay here a while, and <laughs> that's what I did for 15 years. We stayed there, which... Worked out well because it raised a family, had two kids, and we could tend to homestead a little bit and weren't, weren't jumping around the bunch with them. So. A little yeah, more stable life for them. There's pros and cons to everything, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure, sure I, I got to back up because I don't talk to that many people. I've met a few people over the years that were a Davis Motham. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to go out? I assume at some point you probably did, but go out into the boneyard? What, what was that like? I used to have to, uh, we lived uh, off of that gate in a, uh, in an apartment complex. And at one point in time, uh, we only had one car and my wife worked. So I let her use the car and I bicycled to work. So at one point in my career, I was bicycling through the boneyard basically every day to get to work. That uh, had to be really, really cool. That was, uh, yeah, that was just literally just acres and acres or miles and miles of stuff mothballed. Uh, some of it, I was told could be ready to go and, you know, a 30 day notice kind of thing. So that's what I've always heard and probably geek it out on the air force stuff here for a second, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, it, I'm history buff. I've always been a history buff. Mm -hmm. So I would feel like a kid in a candy store to be able to go in there. That's one yeah. of those places I'm like, not that I really wanted to ever get stationed there, but it would have been cool to be like TDY and have an opportunity to drive through. Sure. You sure. know, one of those things that would be like kind of a cool bucket list thing to do uh, just to see different planes and, you know, yeah. pic pictures show you one thing, but I can only imagine the sheer size of that place. Yeah. Lots of B-52s. I seem to remember that. Uh, I didn't actually have to drive through the boneyard, but it was in a fence off to the left as I was going through the gate going. Uh, so be just awesome to, to, to see all that. So yeah. I did not know that. That is really cool stuff. Um, so, you, once you, you retired, and uh, yep. somewhere along the lines, you wrote a children's book. I did. <laughs> so how did that come about? I get a lot of um, stuff from uh, my fellow 462s sometimes, my fellow weapons troops, because they're like, how did you go from loading bombs and blowing stuff up to writing a children's book? That's, that transition makes no sense at all. Well, there's no one set path in life, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes... God just kind of throws you where he wants you and, and you do what he wants you to do. So uh, it all started. Uh, kids growing up, read a lot to them because I enjoyed reading books to them. And I always thought it's like, you know what? These don't, these aren't that in depth. This isn't like John Grisham or anything. These are just children's books. I think I surely I should be able to write a children's book. I wonder how that would go over if I could write a children's book, but I could never come up with the, uh, a story that I didn't feel hadn't been overdone or done before. So I just sat on the idea that I could probably write one at some point in time. And when my son was about eight years old, he's 24 ish now, uh, just got out of the uh, army national guard uh, boot camp and stuff. So he's an MP now. 
Uh, but when he was about eight, uh, I think it was storming that night. And he happened to catch a baby rabbit uh, outside and he brought it in the house and we let it spend the night with us. And then we released it the next day. And after we released it, I looked at my wife and I'm like, well, what was the rabbit's perspective? It's like, hey, here's that, here's that moment. This is the story that I've been waiting on. I had to, as somebody else said, I had to wait for Jasper to come visit me before I, I had the story uh, for the book. Because my son actually named it Jasper in the day that we had it. So uh, that's, uh, that's how that all came about. Uh, now, Jasper the rabbit that he caught was just a brown wild rabbit. Uh, but he still wanted a pet rabbit. So we bought him a, a what's called a Dutch rabbit. And the image of our rabbit, whose name was Digger, because he tried to dig his way out of the cardboard box we brought him home in, is the image that is now Jasper in the book. Wow, that's, so that's awesome. A, that's a neat little uh, way to hold on to that. And so the first book was, uh, was done uh, the night I spent in the people house. I didn't know anything about publishing books or or writing a children's book. I just had the story and the publisher came to me and said, okay, we need to get stuff ready for the illustrator. What, what do you want him to do? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I want him to do. <laughs> it's like, he's an illustrator, right? You know, just read the book and figure it out, you know, kind of thing as well as thinking. So it's like, gee, I, I, all I did was write it. Right. I mean, the inspiration <laughs> just literally happened, just weird coincidences, which I think is probably the most interesting thing about the story is, yeah. That, you know, because there's so many people have an idea. And then it, I think we all probably have those every now and then you're like, oh, yeah, business idea or just random thought like, oh, you could do this. You could do that. And then, you you know, you never do anything with 99 percent of it. You had one of those thoughts of like, oh, well, I could write a children's book like I could do this X, Y and Z. And then sometime later down the road, like here comes, you know, a rabbit your son brings in and names it Jasper. And boom, there's there's the the connection point if you will yeah. of, of yeah, you know put two and two together and making it happen so um that's some that's some pretty cool stuff yeah it's a, a perfect story of taking action you know and having that moment to, to propel you to do something with it rather than just leaving it some nugget of information or an idea in your head yeah i've, I've kind of got a history of doing that uh, as i was uh, talking with cj on the other podcast i don't know if you got a chance to listen to that yeah, one or not. CJ, yeah but uh, yeah, it's I uh, I grew up fearing failure. This kind of ties into to some stuff uh, that that'll ring true for some folks. And so I, I grew up fearing failure. I didn't want to try anything because I didn't want to fail at it. Well, I, I like to redefine failure as a learning experience because you don't fail uh, in the military. You're you the one thing they teach you is like make a decision. Just don't don't not make a decision. You got to make a decision, and then you just got to live with it. You just got to push through it until you get the the end result that you're looking for. So absolutely, and at the end, you can go back and you can reflect and say, "Hey, what went right? What went wrong?" Right, right. Which I right. think is a honestly, um, I've tried telling this to a few people. I think that's a skill that I kind of picked up really well in my life. One of those military skills was is to to look at a situation from different angles to be able to reflect on what just happened. I do that with this podcast. Every single guest, I will look back and be like, okay, what went right? What went wrong? Hopefully the answer is <laughs> more so everything went right. But every now and then it's like, I'll, I'll get an idea of like, oh, all right. Um, for a while, you know, I, I had an ending scene that was a video of me rambling for three minutes. And then it was like, okay, now it's time to redo it. You know, you just kind of continually improve. But exactly. you, don't, you can't do that if you don't go back and reflect. Right, right, right. So, uh, so. Through, through the course of my, my career, uh, like I was telling her, I, I got involved with uh, a racing team. Did some of that for a while. That was fun. And that and that was all brought on. That's when I started to learn about the failure thing, about there is no failure. You just got to push through until you, until you make it. My buddy was uh, – uh, Master Sergeant sat next to me, and he was getting his private pilot's license at the time. And I always thought it'd be cool to fly. Not so much anymore, but uh, I really wanted to get involved in NASCAR. So I see him doing his dream, his goal in life, sitting next to me. And there I am just sitting there doing absolutely nothing to try to get to do anything cool or, you know, achieve any dream that I might have. So I just started writing because that was back a while. So I was like writing and emailing letters and stuff to different uh, race teams up in uh, Charlotte. And finally, one picked me up. 
and uh, we did it for a while as a volunteer sometimes, got paid sometimes. Rich Woodland Racing, he's a really good guy. Uh, never ran a full schedule for anything, but you know what? It was just a lot of fun, and uh, I rode it for as long as I could. And my uh, crowning moment was the first race I ever went to go see as a kid was at Dover, Delaware. The only NASCAR race I worked as a mechanic was for Stan Barrett at Dover, Delaware. So it just went full circle, and we were done. That's and, neat. Uh, I've never been to a race, cool. but that would be a really interesting thing to not only see, but you know, to be a part of. Yeah, it and really part of that machine, that uh, well machine. Yeah, uh, the the first race I I uh, worked with Rich was an ARCA race up in Charlotte, and it was right, it was right after the. Uh, the uh, cup guys did their all-star race. So the, the stands were just packed. There were people everywhere. And uh, that was the first race I ever worked with. And I was sitting on pit road wall, looking up at all these people and they're just roaring and screaming and everything. Cause the all-star race just ended. And I'm like, that's the, how do you like me now moment kind of thing? You know, <laughs> it's like, Hey, I made it. Look at me. Wow. <laughs> so totally I, different perspective that the 99.9% .9 of people would never get, you know, yeah. everybody else could sit in the stands. Not everybody could sit on the, on the wall that'd be kind yeah. of crazy too is they're like coming into pit and uh, I, I i was on the pit crew a couple of times and that's uh that's an interesting time right there that's some, <laughs> something that's kind of scary i it's, had no idea how heavy the tires were and i was a front tire carrier and i came off the wall because I've, I've seen them do it on tv you know i know the procedure and everything so i tried to follow that procedure why well, i have nowhere near the upper body strength that some of those guys <laughs> and that tire went down and it bounced off the it bounced off the uh, pit road, came back up, hit me in the chest, and I'm staggering across the front of the car. I probably looked absolutely foolish, but I maintained. I didn't lose the tire, and I got it. <laughs> that's the good. Field. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's uh, – I, I don't watch a whole lot of racing, but it, I've always been mesmerized by the teamwork, the precision yeah. that they have to do because literally every second counts. Yep. Which I think ties in so well, you know, with us being veterans. Like we we all know that a team has to train together, eat, sleep, and breathe oh. together, to, you know, to be really truly effective. The, so, uh, being a, a weapons loader, we travel in threes is the big joke because we have our crew chief or two men and our three man, and we uh, train just crazy training, for, as you can imagine, working with uh, munitions. Yeah, and we it was don't want an accident way. with that, right? That wouldn't be yeah. good. Yeah, it, it was literally, I mean, I wouldn't have to see what my three-man was doing, but I knew what he was doing, and I knew how long it was going to take him. Uh, so I knew exactly where he would be at all the time. And, I mean, we were all that way. And it's just uh, when you get that kind of cohesiveness, that kind of teamwork, it's it's, it's really wild. Yeah, that, that would be. I would tell you as security forces, we didn't have that kind of teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> we were just trying to uh, to stay out of trouble and stay off people's <laughs> radar. And, and, yeah. and stay away from the aircraft because, you know, the uh, the Security Forces career field had a tendency to bump into aircraft sometimes. No, I've never, I've never <laughs> heard that. I've never heard that. <laughs> they, they should send this to driving school before they really put you on a flight line. You see, you put a bunch of 18, 19-year-olds in a, in a souped-up car or pickup truck and say, drive this around, drive this $40,000 truck, a $50,000 truck, just don't hit the, you know, million dollar aircraft that's sitting yeah. out there. It's like no, no big deal. Just, just don't hit it. Like, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I know, I know. When I was in, it seemed like every year there was a picture popping up, floating around. Be like, don't be this guy. But see this yeah, guy. Don't be this guy. <laughs> Watch where you're going. It doesn't so, matter what base you're at or anything. Somebody is bound to run into one of those oh, things every yeah. single year. Sometimes. To, couple times a year anytime it happened obviously you know it makes a big deal floats around the units like don't be that like i said don't be that guy yeah. but it, it happens so the the children's book i'm kind of curious how it would seem like pretty easy but how difficult was that to to actually write that you know to think about like from a child a child reading it kind of perspective well i took it just a little bit different um uh, i'm looking at it from a, a rabbit's perspective so the, the rabbit is just about as innocent as a child. And, uh, you know, if you think about it among, and amongst his other little woodland friends outside, so I'm, I'm writing it through his eyes. And uh, along with those images, I didn't know what to do for the illustrator. I probably looked silly. I was taking my phone. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I live in a house. I know what I'll do. I'll just take pictures of my house and I'll send them to the illustrator. And say, Can you send? 
So I was out in my backyard taking pictures at like rabbit eye level and stuff so for that I could send off to her so she'd have an idea of uh, what I wanted to write. But yeah, just kind of the innocence of a child, the innocence of a rabbit uh, experiencing something they've never experienced before. You just kind of put yourself in that mindset. And uh, so far it's working through the first two books. I had no idea the first book was going to take off so much. I kind of did it as kind of like a family story kind of thing, you know passed down to my, my grandkids and it ended up selling about 600 copies and people started saying, well, what, what you know, what are you, what, what are you going to do next? What's, what's the next adventure for Jasper? And I'm like, I was going to be one and done. You know, I didn't have any, I'm going to do another one. And, uh, but people kept asking. So I went ahead and I wrote the second one, uh, paying a little bit more attention. Uh, I kind of did everything right by accident on the first one, but the second one I could pay a little bit more attention since I'd been through the process once and uh, make the pictures line up maybe a little bit better. I did a pretty good job on the first one. Uh, I always say I'd rather be lucky than good any day, but I did pay a little bit more attention to the second one. And uh, so the, so even if a child can't necessarily read just yet, they can follow the story along pretty easy just by by the images. Oh, definitely, because I've, I've seen both books. And uh, now I can, I can see where the photographs are from a children's perspective. I can see that now. Um, cause I was thinking, you know, I wouldn't have a clue how to write a children's book, you know, yeah. to, to put your mind in that, in that thought. I mean, I just finished my bachelor's degree, right? So everything I've been writing for the last couple of years has either been for business or, you know, college level stuff. So it's like, sure. how would I start to write a book for children? You know, and children's books, of course, vary too, from very little text to, you know, that graduation step to you know chapter books where you know yeah. half the page is, is text but it is a really cool book i will say uh my kids are a little little too old for for that genre mm -hmm. but they would have loved that as little kids they really would have because yeah, it, it is an adventure yeah i tried to hit that sweet spot like you're talking about they're only about 28 pages long i tried to hit that sweet spot so it's like a good bedtime story you're not sitting there you know reading this chapter book for a bedtime story or anything you're reading just a nice little cute fun story uh that's only about 28 pages long so we tried to hit that that middle ground yeah i say it's uh it's, it's that perfect book for like little little kids to the kids that are starting to learn how to read because there's not a ton of text to it uh exactly. it's the first words that they kind of learn and uh, my yeah. children are well, if I can get them to read more consistently, they'd be into chapter books all the time. <laughs> they just want to play video it's games hard. all the time. They do it read, but hard. yeah, it is. But uh, you know, you mentioned Illustrator. Uh, so tell us about the the process on that uh, and what the hell that went for you finding an Illustrator. Sure, uh, that was a, I got hooked up with a great publishing. Well, at least I think they're a great publishing company. Fulton Publishing. I'll certainly give them a shout out here. Uh, it's kind of a not a traditional publisher, not quite a vanity publisher. They're kind of got this little soft middle ground area that they work in. Uh, they supplied me with about 10 illustrators that I could choose from. And uh, some of them were had more detail in their drawing. Some of them had less detail in their drawing, you know, that sort of thing. Some of them were a little bit more of that. I think they call it anime, you know, than, than just regular stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So, uh, I, I picked the one that had the less detail because I knew I was going to the younger kids. And it's like, I don't want them to get all wrapped around the axle and seeing all this detail and all these pictures and, you know, all this fluff and stuff. It's like, I wanted to look more like a Saturday morning cartoon, you know, comic book kind of kind of feel and kind of look to it. Uh, so it's a little bit easier for them to, to visualize and, and see and not be uh, have all the noise, if you will, of a bunch of distracting details. Uh, and I think we hit a sweet spot on that as well. There, on the first book, I remember saying, can I get just a little bit more detail on this page, a little bit more detail on that page? And they would do it for me. Uh, but uh, it was definitely a cool, cool experience. And, and they were real good about making changes. Uh, never been a problem. Uh, it takes about eight months to actually get one done and published. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. That had to be pretty crazy to to see that put together, to see your words and the images and, and pull that whole story together. It, it's fun to watch. It's it it quite a learning experience and it was, it's really cool to watch it, how it all comes together and how they, they've got very specific orders that they do everything in. Uh, I don't know that I still understand why they do them in those orders, but it works. So Everybody, everybody's got their process, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you think has been the most difficult aspect of being an author? Is there something that's uh, been harder than you think? Yes, because I fell backward into this kind of to begin with. I had no clue what marketing and promotion was all about. I mean, I, I worked with marketing a little bit at Ram Clutches. I worked a little bit with the marketing guys. So I'm not a complete idiot, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, I know a little bit about what to do, but not as far as books are concerned. Uh, so I really have to back up and regroup and uh, and start learning a lot about trying to promote and market books. And, uh, I've got my feet under me a little bit. But there's always room for improvement. I've got them everywhere online, Amazon.com, you know, Walmart.com even has them. Uh, and pretty much anywhere online. And my goal this next year or two, hopefully this year, is to get them physically stocked in stores. I mean, that's what every author wants, right? I mean, they all want their stores, their, their books in the stores. So we're trying. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Uh, Jasper has his own Facebook page, Instagram page. Uh, you got the website scrolling at the bottom. It'll be in the show links as well for, for anybody listening to it. Yeah, he's got the his own webpage, uh, www.jasper-n-friends.com. We've got a Zazzle page, which is uh, where you can get all your uh, uh, all your little cups or saucers or uh, clocks, blankets, pillows with uh, Jasper and his buddies on them. Uh, and... Uh, just, you know, you just keep hitting it. I, I like to say I don't know what I don't know or what I should know to do this. So I just try to outwork everybody. I just I just keep digging, keep posting, just keep at it, keep podcasting. Um, book signings. I haven't had many. I just had my first one the other day. It didn't, it didn't it wasn't it didn't go over it went over okay. Uh, the store I was in only had six customers all day and I sold four books. So you know, well, I mean, I say ratio wise, you did pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so, so percentage wise, it was awesome, but uh, just not many people showed up. I'm hitting those now. Next weekend, I'm, I was asked, and this is the first time I got asked. Somebody actually contacted me, which blew me away, and said, "Hey, we're having a, a, a walk for autism next weekend. Uh, do you mind coming down and setting up a little table with your uh, books? You know, just to display your books and talk to people about them." I'm like, mm, "Yes, of course I will. I'll be right there." So that would be kind of cool. Yeah, that's neat. And I, I would imagine there's a lot of like the book companies, right? Like the big ones, uh, well, you know, Amazon or the actual physical bookstores like Barnes and Noble. I can't imagine how many books they have, plus how many books they get pitched on a daily basis. It's got to be insane. So cutting through that fog, if you will, has, has got to be an interesting process. It's not easier. Everybody would do it. Um, there is, there is a, a little caveat to Barnes & Noble, though. I found this out through uh, just asking questions because I it's what I do. I just, you know, if I don't know anything, I just get on all these Facebook and pages for writers and stuff and ask a bunch of questions. They have a uh, local author section. If you take your book physically into the store, you talk to the store manager, he'll look over it. It's not a short thing, but he'll look over it. And if he likes it, he'll put it in the store. He's got that authority that he can put local authors in his, in his Barnes and Noble. So I actually had our local Barnes and Noble. I had the first book. I haven't got the second book in there yet, but I've got the first book in there. That's awesome. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Not a lot of folks know about that, but, uh, you know. Well, there's something helpful for all the authors that might be listening to it. Yeah. Yeah. A, I mean, cause there's a, I, I would imagine you can pretty much find a Barnes and Noble in just about every state. You know, I know they're pretty much nationwide. I don't know yeah. anymore, but uh, I'll, I'll admit myself. I haven't been physically in a bookstore in quite a while. <laughs> yeah, no. sometimes, sometimes it's easy just to get them online or uh, audio books. You know, obviously that doesn't work for children's books, but yeah. for adult books, audio books are a great way to go, uh, especially if you're driving around. But uh, yeah, that's a really helpful piece of information. Yeah, I never know who might uh, might need that. Um, so one other thing I wanted to ask, because I know you've had those struggles with you know, trying to figure all this stuff out. How have you stayed motivated, you know, and find ways to keep pushing on and do the second book and third book and who knows whatever else is out in the future when, you know, when you keep running into brick walls left and right? Yeah, I just, uh, I, I just, you know, and I don't know if it's just the, the the outlook I had through the Air Force and just failure is not an option kind of thing. 
it's just, a lot of this stuff just rolls off my back. I mean, it's just, uh, I just keep going. Uh, I really feel like the good Lord put me on this path for a reason. So that helps me uh, stay focused. Um, book three has been written. Uh, it's not been published yet. I like to try to get sales up in the first, uh, the last book I published. I tried to make pay for this, the next book coming up. So I'm not out a whole lot of my own pocket money. It's uh, a good idea. But uh, yeah, um, it's I don't I just don't find it hard to stay focused. Uh, it just it's kind of overtaking my. I almost feel like this is more of my first job than my actual daily job is. It's kind of taken over a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, the first book is Jasper in a People House. Yeah. The what is the people house, yeah. What is uh, what is the title of the second one? Second one is a day at the beach with Jasper and friends. And the third one, I'll let a little nugget out about the third one. I, I was just going to ask. That. That's why I set it up the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I haven't come up with the title of the third one yet, but the little, little nugget out, uh, Jasper and his friends are going to go uh, visit their friend Mouse on the uh, farm. And they're going to feed the animals and plant some crops and have some fun. Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, because I think it was uh, the, the second book at the beach where he was there with his friends. Mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of different characters could be a direction to go maybe in the future. I don't know. Maybe I'll drop some, drop some nuggets, <laughs> maybe, you know, some adventures with all of his friends. Cause who doesn't like going places with friends, right? <laughs> right. right. That's, and that's what I like about these books. Somebody described them as just a, a good story. that just lets kids be kids. It's not really in depth about trying to teach them anything or, or you know, change their direction one way or the other, or any of that kind of crazy stuff. It's just, Read it. It's a bunch of animals that you wouldn't typically think would be friends, but they are, and they just go out and uh, do some crazy stuff and just learn together, if nothing else. If you put it that way. That's an interesting, you know, maybe lessons that kids kids may not get, but you know that that there are animals that you wouldn't see normally together or think of, yeah. of being being friends. But that's life in general too. You know, you can meet people with all kinds of diverse backgrounds and you can still be friends and still enjoy life and be connected and have meaningful relationships. Yeah. So there's a, a good possible lesson for children. So, well, Doug, I, I appreciate you coming on here and kind of highlight, highlight what you do. Any, uh, any last words about uh, what you got going on or any pieces of advice for other aspiring authors, whether it's children's books or not? Uh, the only other piece of advice I got, I, I just learned, or didn't learn, but I just kind of came on it. I don't know if there's anything here or not, but I'm going to share it anyway, just because I thought it was kind of interesting. A lot of folks will wonder, because I'm now looking to get my books in stores. And I went to the local Walmart to look at uh, authors because I had some questions I wanted to ask uh, other authors about getting my books in stores. So I got the uh, the author's names and uh, the publishing companies off the back of the books for other kids books and I did some research and I sent them emails and asked them questions but then it dawned on me it's like you know if you're trying to get your book in a store it might behoove you to go in there and look what publishers that store already stocks and you might want to hit those publishers first and see if they're accepting anything uh, new as far as books are concerned it might give you an in to that store to be stocked in that store I'm not saying it will but it might my dog, it, uh, it's not a bad start. It's a good place to start. Well, it would definitely be more likely that they would have an opportunity to get you in there versus a, a company that has no ties to that store. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Just, you know, you know and, you, and I guess you could also look and see where those companies, I mean, because obviously the, the, the purpose would be to get your book in as many stores as possible, nationwide, internationally, whatnot. Um, but, to, you know, to see which, which companies are doing that in the most amount of companies out there, you know, yeah. maybe another thing to look at. So I'm sure there's a lot of tips and tricks <laughs> to, uh, to get in that stuff. You just got to find, ask the question, right? Yep. Just got to, and, uh, the authors I contacted were really good about getting back to me and answering my question. So I highly recommend if you are going to do that, that, to go do that and get the author's uh, information and try to contact them if you have any questions, because they were really, they've really been helpful. Awesome. You know, you've got other great resources too, because you mentioned CJ uh, Ives Lopez and, and her podcast, the, the Author's Porch. You know, she definitely knows a lot about writing and publishing and 
everything about it. So <laughs> she she is a great resource. Her her lives, the, you know, free shout out for her podcast and what she does. But if you are writing anything, she's she's the person you definitely want to to connect with. She's got uh, my book and uh, two others, one of hers and one of her friends. Uh, they're they're uh, traveling books. Uh, they're going all over the, the nation to different places and stuff. And uh, folks are taking pictures with them at different national monuments and that sort of thing and putting them on social media, trying to, to get some uh, some exposure for them. So that's, that's turned awesome. out pretty cool. Well, speaking of photos and exposure, you have a cutout of Jasper, don't you? Did I see that on Facebook the other day? I got them right here. Oh, you got them right here. <laughs> there you go. Oh, let me get the sun. There you go. That's even bigger than I thought, too. There's my buddy. That's yeah, a, yeah, that's a pretty good size. Holy cow! <laughs> he's about uh, he's about two and a half feet tall, I think. Nice. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere between two and a half and three feet tall. I tried to make him kid sized uh, so the kids can come up and have their picture taken with him. He's going to be at the autism uh, walk next Saturday as well. So I bet that will really get a lot of interest from ch from kids. You know, because uh, so. you know, right at their eye level. As they're scanning around, they're like, there's a rabbit in my eyes. <laughs> like, like, mommy, daddy, like, let's go over here, check this out. I know my kids would have been all over that. So, but yeah, uh, my, it's really cool. My granddaughter came over the other day and she saw him and right away she started dancing with him. So that was kind of cool. I wish I'd have gotten a picture of that. That was a, that was a neat moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you got to go to stuffed animals next. Get a, get a Jasper I'm stuffed animal. Looking, that's, that is pricey. Uh, I'm um, sure that I'm is. Have to sell some books first. Yeah, but, yeah get, get that, some little that, kid fans, right? And then they can uh, hit up hit up mom and dad for Christmas time. Mom, dad, I need a Jasper. Uh, I need my Jasper toys. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think uh, when I looked at it and uh, got it all figured out, it's like, man, I have to sell these things for about thirty five dollars, and it's like, good Ooh, gracious, that's a, that's a lot of cabbage. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a nugget to keep for down the road, right? Yeah, we're just, we're going to keep looking yeah, for sure. I'm trying to have stuff done in America too. I don't, I don't, I'm not real interested in getting stuff done overseas. Uh, I mean, main reason is I just like America first, you know, kind of stuff. I just, you know, absolutely, we, we can do our own thing. And when you get stuff, and when I worked for a couple other companies, they would get not all their product, but pieces and parts from places overseas. And next thing you know, you're waiting for three months for something to show up that should have showed up a lot quicker just because oh, it's on a slow boat from somewhere. You know, or you have unforeseen things like the pandemic and what it did to ship to supply chains. And, you know, for yep. a lot of people, um, I know you're in the vetchpreneur tribe like I am and, and saw a lot of supply chain issues. People were talking about in there left and I right. Told, I was told uh, at the end of uh, completing my second book, publishing the publisher sent me a message and said, if you want to get copies, you better hurry up and get them. Cause uh, there, there's uh a possibility we're going to have a supply shortage, uh, you know, of paper, I guess, or ink, because they're they're made in Tennessee, is where the uh, distributor is. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you got to think about those things too, where they're where they're getting their supplies for their when they're making them. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of things to think of. But anyway, Doug, I, I appreciate you coming by and, and sharing your story. I think it's such a neat and different story than I get to normally share on here. Children's books and you know, kind of pushing, pushing through, um, you know, some of those things and sharing your story about Davis Motham. That was really cool. Yeah, no um, I guess I'm gonna have to take a road trip down to, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little ways from Illinois, but, uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Appreciate you being on here and being a battle buddy. Well, thanks for having me on. I've had a blast and it, this is about my fifth podcast. Now I'm actually finally starting to maybe feel a little comfortable talking about myself. It was really oh, you did, you did great. Time. It's all good. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll say, you know, real quick, it's still scrolling at the bottom. It'll be in the in the show notes, but it's jasperandfriends.com, jasper-and-friends.com. Uh, so you can go check out your website, buy a book. buy Amazon.com, yep. On Amazon, all that stuff. I'll have all the links in the show notes for everybody. Uh, but uh, So not only go there, but go find Jasper, like, follow, Facebook page, all that stuff. Don't forget to like and, like and subscribe to my podcast as well and share this, especially with anybody who's got little kids. I know we're not, you know, we're not near Christmas, but birthdays. Don't forget about birthdays Perfect. for little ones. Easter. East, Easter. Easter's right around the corner. So, uh, yeah. So, go, go check it out. Yes, sir.